All right. Um, welcome to the Mark Edit webinar series. This is the fifth and final webinar in the five webinar series, and we're focusing on scripting and Mark Edit today. Terry Reese is our presenter, and he is the head of digital initiatives at the Ohio State University, and is the creator and developer of Mark Edit. I will now turn the mic over to Terry. Okie dokie. So. Um... As always, I want to include the note thanking Carly since these eventually make their way um, onto uh, YouTube and for broader availability. So, um, all right, second, I'm gonna figure out what happened to my thing here. There it is. So I can see if anybody asks any questions. All right, all right. So um, this is this was one of those that was kind of challenging to think about. Um, I, I actually put some thought into this quite a bit because uh, um, folks don't usually uh, there. It tends to be asked on an individual basis uh, how to um, do scripting and automation, and it's it's difficult in an hour, say for example, to to teach a scripting class that really or, or even a session that's not really practical. Um, so what I'm going to try and do here is um, in MarkEdit there's a tool called a scripting wizard and the, it was designed around this concept that uh, everybody might want to learn how to code at some point um, and so it actually creates for you um, a good deal of template code and it does it in either Perl or um, Visual Basic Script and since um, the Visual Basic Script is, is part of the Windows operating system. That tends to be what I use for my examples. Um, and so what we'll do is we will look at the script maker and what it does, because it's, it's very simple in, in a lot of respects. Um, it provides some functionality. Some of it actually fairly interesting in terms of conditional functionality. Um, but it, it's also very basic in, in the sense that since I'm generating scripts, I've had to be um, pick, pick very specific tasks. So if you need to go beyond those, you have to know how to edit them. Um, the nice thing is editing happens only in one very small part of, a, of a, a script generated by the template. And in fact, if anybody's ever asked um, me uh, to do something to, for advice, and the answer has been, um, I think this would work better in a script, I probably started by just generating um, the template from the script maker, and then adding the 10 or 15 lines of code that actually did whatever it was that um, that uh, the individual was asking for. Uh, so it is a time saver for me um, when, when this kind of stuff comes up. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the script maker. Uh, we will look at some of the functions within the script maker because there are helper functions that show you how to interact with mark edits um, object tools we will look at the API and where you can go to get information about the API we'll generate a couple scripts we'll even generate one that the script maker I'm pretty sure is going to fail on because um, there are a couple of things that uh, that can sometimes get complicated and tweak tweaky and I've been working so you'll need to know how to debug the scripts um, and then uh, and then see if there are any questions and go from there. So um, I think that's kind of what I'm going to do. All right, so the script maker um, and the, is basically a tool that was, like I said, created with Mark, in MarkEdit to um, allow people to do some of the things that uh, outside of the, the MarkEdit application, edits outside of the MarkEdit application, um, in a way that interacted with the uh, the mark edit um, tools tool set uh, for a very long time and even still today uh, I very rarely use the um, the user interface of mark edit uh, the the when I'm working with the application I tend to work just with the the programming libraries because a lot of times I'm working with very big files and by very big files I mean files that are um, anywhere between um, a half gigabyte to maybe up to half a terabyte. Um, and so when I'm working with files that large, while the editor can certainly open them and edit them, it, it takes a lot. What I would like to be able to do is run all of the operations that I'm going to do at once. And so when that ends up being the case, I, I want to actually work 
in the actually would prefer scripting the, the task. And so the script maker was designed as a way to give folks who didn't know how to script um, a way to generate um, very quick uh, scripting applications that then they could run. Um, I, I should step back and say that the script wizard was actually the first attempt at providing an automation, providing automation support and mark edit. I, to some degree, I think that uh, the being able to automate the tool um, has been the hardest part of working with the application because the the range of 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 individuals that use the application, the knowledge level of, you know, from people who do um, development themselves and actually want to interact with the components to folks who would want to have more of a macro recorder approach to being able to automate um, the application. Um, and so there are different, the script wizard wasn't created for the folks who want more of the um, automation part, you know, the, the script the script recording, that was kind of really what the, the task automation tool was created for. This is really more for folks who want to do the, the scripting. So the script wizard um, provides templates for sorting data, um, making and breaking the files, um, and then there are um, a simplified helper tools uh, specifically for working with innovative data. Uh, some of, uh, having come from an institution that worked with innovative uh, interfaces, uh, sp specifically Millennium at the time, uh, there were some issues with how data was exported. And I'm not quite sure if those are still exist. Um, it's one of those things I probably should follow up on now that they do see or maybe some of these problems have kind of dissipated. Um, but at the time, we needed ways to be able to correct data that was exported from the system if we were going to pull data out, work with it, and then put it back in. All right. So um, understanding how it works. So I'm going to bounce out here, bounce in and out, and we're going to try something new too because I'm actually going to emulate the environment that we're working in. Um, I, I don't actually install Mark Edit on my machine. I run it. Um, you can actually install Mark Edit just by dropping it into the application, but when you do that, you can't use the scripting stuff. So I'm actually going to run this within a virtualized environment. Hopefully, this will all work well, great. Um, all right, so Mark Edit is template based. So let me so make sure let me see what you guys are seeing here. Okay, good. All right, so Mark Edit is template based. So when you run, um, when you open the application, and we had talked about this earlier, there is the application shortcuts um, application path. You can actually see. Um, the templates that Mark Edit uses for generating scripts. So under configs, and there's this uh, template here called VB script template, and then there's one called uh, Perl template. And if you look at these, you can actually change um, the template code so that you can work with them and, and change the arguments. So um, this is what you get. It starts out, it's a couple lines of code that you don't have to write. They're, they're things that are common to, to every part of the application. So within those template codes, and I've, I've copied them here so we don't have to keep going back and forth, but within the template codes there are what are called template functions. And these are helpers. They essentially encapsulate different functions within the application so that you don't have to rewrite how to work with the objects every single time. They also make some assumptions, these functions. So in MarkEdit there are easy ways to um, do uh, character encoding on the fly. Uh, these templated functions, these template functions just process the data. They don't actually do um, character set switching for you. So if the data is in Mark 8, the data is going to be processed in these templated fun uh, functions as Mark 8. If they're in Unicode, they're going to be processed as Unicode. If they're um, Big 5, they're going to be processed as Big 5. If you want to include character set uh, transformations, there are um, optional parameters that you can add to these elements, and we'll look at that with the API code here in a minute. Um, so if we walk through this function, 
um, just uh, very quickly. Um, there's the start and end of the function, so this is how we go into it. You're basically passing a source file and a destination file. Mark edit has streaming functions. So you can actually pass in just a block of text that's in Mark and get back out either XML or non-XML. That should be, we'll see if those are, if I've updated the documentation to see if they're there here in a minute. Um, so in a scripting language, we have to declare objects. So um, like Perl, Ish VB script um, creates uh, t treats objects as as very as as um, variables as objects, so they, they aren't hard typed. So um, they get typed when you interact with them. So here we've created an object. One of them is the mark breaker object. This is the object MB. This is a return object. It's going to eventually end up being an integer. The first thing we end up doing is we're checking to see if the files exist. So did somebody pass the template provides code to see um, is the file that you passed um, there. And if it's not, then it quit. It gives you a message and quits. Um, but this right here, these two lines are actually the important lines. So uh, within Visual Basic Script and within the template, we'll in fact, we can pop open the Perl one here in a minute. We have to create the object. So Mark edits a bunch of objects. So in programisms, in Windowsisms, these are automation objects. The automation object is Mark Engine 5. Um, even though Mark Edit is in Mark Edit 6, I try to not change the engine name because it has um, implications for people that use it. Um, I just change version numbers, so mark edit 5, mark 21. Mark 21 is the object that has all of the functionality that does the mark engine part of the application. Um, and then you call the mark file um, tool, which see the API, what are the available functions. This is the one that breaks um, the uh, file from mark into the mnemonic file format. We pass the source and destination. The return variable here will return a positive number um, with the number of records processed or a negative number that corresponds to an error code. Um, and then at the end we exit out of the function and return back the, uh, the value that tells us um, how many records were processed so that way we can tell if there was an error or not. Um, Template, so this is the one of the template functions, encapsulates the breaker functionality. Uh, this is the one that encapsulates the maker functionality, so I have a, a program, a file that's in the mnemonic format. It looks basically exactly the same. The only difference here is um, there's a different function that's called uh, that tells you to remake the file rather than to break it. Whoops. All right, so the tasks that can be automated um, and uh, by, after we go through this, we'll open up the script maker. The task that can be automated is you can add and delete fields um, using conditionals or not. Um, you can modify subfield data um, and variable variable field subfield data. And then, like I said, there are some uh, I corrections that you can use to generate from uh, this particular tool. All right, so. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and build some sample scripts, and we're going to open the script maker and work with it. Um, I think this is going to make it easier for folks to understand what's going on. All right, so this is the template here for the uh, the script maker in VB script. I'd mentioned that there is one in Perl, so I'll open the Perl one just so you can take a look at it. So edit. So this is the Perl script. Um, for Perl um, on Windows, this is line right here is actually the important one. I wonder if I can make these let me, uh, make this a little bit bigger font so maybe it's easier for folks to read on the screen, just in case it's problematic. All right, there we go. All right, so this right here is actually um, how Perl interacts with um, the uh, uh, um, Windows uh, automation components. It's OLE, so Windows 32 OLE. Um, again, it has template functions. So the template function here, this is the, the function that handles the breaking of a file. You'll see it looks different um, than Visual Basic Script, but not a whole lot. Um, in a sense, we still have to create the object. In this case, we're still creating the exact same object name. We're still calling the same function. Uh, the difference is 
that we treat um, variables differently. So variables are defined differently, they're scoped differently. So if you're a Perl person, this this is probably very poor Perl script because I'm not a, a big Perl coder, but um, this looks probably much more familiar to you than, than working with a uh, uh, Visual Basic script side. So you can use, uh, and this would run under Active Perl if you're running um, on a machine. All right, so let's look at the script maker really quickly. So the script maker is found under add-ins. Uh, script wizard is what it's called. Um, I need to uh, make a note here. Um, one of the things I've been working on recently is a, a port of Mark Edit. Um, there is a port that exists for Linux systems. We're working on one. I'm working on one for Mac systems. There are some things that will end up uh, not being um, in scope, and the script wizard happens to be one of those um, because the uh, the automation components that get used here really are window centric. Um, I may look at it at a different point in time, seeing if I can provide a set of tools that make that possible, so that you might be able to generate, say, Python or Perl scripts that could run on other platforms. But at this point, these are very Windows specific. This is a very Windows specific kind of uh, operation um, at this point in time. It, it it assumes you're working in Windows. So, so this is what the script wizard looks like. Um, this is the add and delete function. You can add and delete fields, and you can add and delete fields based on conditionals. So in this case up here, um, one of the things that's very difficult to do within the Mark editor itself is to say, or it used to be, some of the, the tools that are there since I added the option for add field if they have found um, does this. But it used to be difficult to say I want to add a field or I want to delete a field if another field is present or another field with specific data elements is present. Um, that's actually something you can do in the script wizard here um, by checking the use conditional box and the has um, option is an in string option. The regular express regex is a regular expression option. So if you can represent it as either an, a string match or a regular expression. So in this case, what we could do is we can give it a field, um, a specific field. So I have here a, a data set. Let me get a small data set. So that's a little larger than a small data set. Maybe this is a smaller data set. Yeah, they're both the same. All right, so I have a data set here. A couple of them with 11 different records. And let's say um, I wanted to create a script that is going to add a new field um, anytime it came across, um, let's say, uh, it'll only do it should only do it for one record, assuming these aren't duplicates, um, this particular item. So if, if there's a, or actually let's, let's say uh, any 090 that uh, has an LB call number. All right, so we can go ahead and do that. So we can say conditional, we're going to say 090 here has, uh, we could do, this will be a, a somewhat um, loose uh, process. If I wanted to do this um, uh, at a very precise level, I'd use a regular expression. So let's say has LD. So it's going to look for that string within the 090. And if it's there, we'll go ahead and add a new field. Um, this field has been added. All right, and then we just go ahead and say add that field. And so you'll see that a set of parameters are put in below. You don't have to care what those are. Um, they're just so that you can actually click on them and delete them if you decide you don't want them. Um, so they're there for, for those purposes. So let's say I also want to just um, delete a field globally. I'm going to delete the 035. So that I just want to get rid of, and then I'm going to um, add another field, not conditionally, um, <clears throat> with uh, indicators that I'm going to make up. All right, so I've I've went ahead and, and created some criteria here. We'll just leave that there for a second. Um, all right, modified. We can modify uh, subfield data. This does the exact same thing in terms of using conditionals. You can modify a specific subfield based on conditional data. Now, this isn't nearly as powerful as the functionality that's actually in the uh, 
the mark editor right now because um, if you remember within the mark editor when we talked about this in the last session you have the ability to do conditional subfield inserts based on position using some special syntax um, there's the ability to move data around um, there's just a, a number of different options those aren't replicated here um, if you need to do or specific subfield editing functions rather than these, then that's where you want to drop into the script itself and make those changes directly. Um, rather than, uh, and this is actually, I should point out, the part of the script that, that sometimes gets a little wonky. So when I use conditionals and then tell it to do subfield stuff, occasionally you may run into a, a gen, an error that gets generated by the script, not on the data, but the script has compile error. Um, so you have to be able to go in and correct it. Um, I don't use this often, often so I'm going to skip that. But that's, this is, that's what this does. Um, and then these are the additional options, specific options that were there um, when working with Innovative. Um, and I'm not sure if these are still true with Sierra. Maybe somebody on the list has a better idea. Um, but one of the things that <clears throat> used to happen um, in most default installations within an Innovative system is that the, uh, the one um, would have the, uh, the OCLC um, or the prefixes stripped away from them. That's problematic when you re-overlay the data um, because the load tables, unless you're using a non, the, unless you're using one that's not the default load tables, looking for those prefixes. So this, if you check that box, it would put the the prefix back into the 001. Um, Innovative's Millennium system. I'm not sure if they carried this over to Sierra, used to have issues when you would export data with punctuation at the end of fields. Um, they had two options. One was pre-AACR2 and one was non-pre-AACR2. It wasn't AACR2. It was one or the other. And depending on the option you selected, it would either delete punctuation from every field um, at the end of the field or it would add punctuation to every element at the end of the field, whether it had it in the original record or not. Um, so what this option would do is it would go back through and correct that based on the field and what it knew about how punctuation should be represented on that field. It would either add or remove the punctuation marks from the end of the record so that it would look like it was supposed to when it went back into the system. <clears throat> For those of you that are um, innovative users, you know that the 949 um, is what's used as a bibliographic overlay code. When you export data from an innovative system, um, the 949 shows up in one of the 9xx fields. Checking this box would generate a 949 for an overlay code because generally when I was pulling records out of the system, I'd want to overlay them again. <clears throat> the remove 9xx fields, um, innovative uh, Default loader prefers that the 9xx fields not be present outside of the 949, so that checkbox would just by default remove the 9xx fields from the exported data. And then the last option um, isn't one that we would use uh, locally, but occasionally um, folks would ask for ways to easily resort fields into numeric, numeric sort order. Uh, the Mark Editor does this now. It was before those sorting functions were available in the Mark Editor. Um, <clears throat> but you could check this box and it would initiate a, a sort field option. So we went ahead and so those are the additional fields. So I'm going to just start with these. We're going to go ahead and generate the script. So we'll save it. Um, it just asks you to put it somewhere. All right, and so the script's been generated. Now the nice thing about scripts that are generated with the script wizard um, is they can be edited by the script wizard as long as they haven't been changed outside of this tool. So if I wanted to edit this script, I could go back and um, pick up the script and all of the parameters are reloaded. I could add new add delete field functions. I could change the additional option set. I could change the modified field set and then resave it. Um, where you, <clears throat> when that's not possible, is if you've changed the script by hand. If you've changed the script by hand, um, at that point, you're no longer able to edit um, using the tool. Um, 
or I should say if you do edit using the tool you will lose edits that you've made and the reason for that is if you look at the script <clears throat> you will see that there's a block up here that's added to the script that includes the list of parameters that you've added through the script wizard and those are what's re those are what are reread by the tool when it is um, trying to decide whether or not it can make those changes and I need to obviously update this because the generated template because I have that is no longer good all right um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's look and see what the actually was generated by the script. So all of this stuff here, this is for free. The part that's actually generated is what happens right here. So this function here, uh, function main, this is the main procedural loop for script generated by um, the script wizard. And for an individual that wants to edit, um, the templates that are created. So let's say you just wanted to create a, a blank template. You could open the script wizard and then just hit save and it would generate a blank template that does nothing. I'll put this code. Um, this is where you would make your changes in this function. It, more precisely, where you would make the changes is in this loop right here. Um, this loop here, the loop that runs um, in this stretch here, the do while loop, this read this this loop here is actually reading um, the record line by line, and it's doing stuff. And so in this case, uh, we've asked it to do a couple of things. And so one of the things we asked it to do was we asked it to conditionally add data. And so that's what this that's what this line right here, these lines right here do. Um, we have asked it to conditionally add some data. So it's looking for in the line that it's reading, are the first four bytes of that line an 090 field? If the answer is yes, it's going to look to see if the LD shows up in that string. And if it does, it marks that parameter as true. If we go back up into the loop, we see here that when the program when the script runs across a blank line which designates within the mnemonic file that a record has ended it checks to see has that um, boolean been set to true and if it has then it adds the field and if it hasn't then it ignores it and then when it's finished um, and it gets past that argument it resets that boolean to false because in the next record we're going to want to reevaluate it the string below it is the field we globally added. So this is the one where we said we want to add for every record an equal an, a 991. So that's what happens in this field, uh, this part of the, the, um, app, the script. The mark string is a global variable that's holding the record as it's processed. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm just adding that 991 uh, to the, the record as the last um, as the last item in the in the record. If I wanted to sort that numerically, then I would go back and I would check the sort option. And we can. We can go ahead and look at that in a minute. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have here this section of code here, which is going to say, um, is the field a 035 field? And if it is, then we're going to blank it out. So it's going to delete that field. So that's our record. So in order to run a script generated by the script wizard, and this is part of the reason for, for doing this like this way, all you have to do is you just grab um, the, the, the record that you want to process and drag it onto the script. And it's done. And so when it's finished, it'll tell you how many records were processed and what's been done. Uh, the script gets generated using, um, this is the one right here, so it takes the name of the script you were working with, and adds rev to the end of it um, if you just drag and drop. If you click on the script uh, like this, then it'll ask you for the source file, and then it'll ask you where you want to save the file so you can change the names yourself. Uh, so if we go ahead and look at this, uh, this particular script, uh, the file we just processed, we can see here that the new field was added. And let's see here, this one, oh, LB, I picked the wrong one. Let's see if there was an LD in here. Otherwise, it shouldn't be anything. Equals 090 dot star.
four, six. And then we'll see LD and see if any of these are here. See if there actually was one of those. No, not enough parentheses. Would I leave it? Ah, there it is. Okay, so there wasn't one, so we're not going to see that field. So we can we can go back and we can edit that uh, that script. So I made a mistake. So I can go back to the script wizard. Can open up the script, and we can select that option and delete it. Go back here and say O nine O has L L B. Then we want to add the 999 field. Add it, and we'll go ahead and add the sort this time. Resave that to desktop. Okay, script's been regenerated. If we look at the script, You'll see at the top, there's a new option, sort true, so it tells it that the sort's been added. And if we look down in the script itself, we'll see here that uh, these two elements, this element here has been added, and that's um, how it handles the sorting of the, uh, the data. You'll also see that the, the file looks differently, so now um, there's a different Boolean code that's used. and and it updated the script to change the uh, the value because we deleted the line. Now it's going by line number, but we can see that LB has been added instead of LD. So now when we run it, uh, presuming that I uh, got the right elements again, drag and drop, <clears throat> processes the records. We can go ahead and take a look at those records. All right, now we should see, here it is. Here's the new field that we added, the 991. Um, in the old, when we ran it the first time, that field was the very last field in the, uh, the record. But since we're asking it to sort, it sorted it into um, order. And we see here that this 99 field has been added because the 090 had an LB in the string. So using the script wizard we were able to fairly easy create some some conditionally conditional scripts that we were able to work with. Um, as I mentioned I use this not to generate scripts but I use it to generate templates. So if someone was to ask me um, to generate a script I would uh, to write a script I would just open the script wizard save it And then um, open up my script here. And what we'll see is a couple of things. One is I didn't add any parameters. So there's nothing up on top. And in the main loop, you'll see that the loop is much smaller. Nothing's happening there. This is the main loop. Um, this is where I would add my code to decide um, what I wanted to do with a particular um, set of data with a particular string. And this is where I can get very complicated. I can do um, a lot more things in this block in terms of um, capturing data based on the presence or non-presence of strings, um, doing very complicated adds or modifications, um, and do it all within this set of, of this loop. And to be honest, a lot of times do it in um, the range of 15 to maybe at the high end. Uh, 30 lines of code. So the template, even though I may not use it for um, creating the script per se, I get to, I get all of the the surrounding code for free, um, all the automation templates and everything, and I just have to add a little bit of logic in that in this set. All right, let's go back to the slides. All right, so that was the example script. Um, mentioned the primary block. This is the main loop. So if you go back later and you're looking at this, this is what that main loop looks like that you're going to be editing in the script. Um, all the edits happen within that loop. Um, and we looked at some examples. Um, I wanted to also point out uh, before we show 
I go to the API and the methods, um, MarkEdit has two COM objects. One is the Mark Engine, and one is Z39.50, the Z39.50 object. So I happen to have a script here. Show it, look at it. It's right here. So we have the the Mark 5 engine, which is kind of the, the main, that is the, the automation object. So all of the other functions that you can work with hang off of that object. And then query is the class. So that's the Z39.50 class. And then this uses um, Library of Congress. So in this case, we set up an object that's going to create the object, and then we attach some parameters. So the database is Voyager. And this is using their older um, syntax. Um, I could update it, but I haven't yet. So this database is Voyager. Host is this URL, their port, their syntax, um, start and limit. So I only am going to ask for one. And then here I'm going to pass um, a title. And I pass four because that's an attribute telling me that I'm actually searching for title. And we'll see in the API documents where these that four comes from. So sense. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm just grabbing one record if it's there and then message boxing it so that you can actually see it. But at this point I would probably save it or do something with it. So if I run this script, it's going out and talking to um, the good folks at the Library of Congress and it's returning back a uh, an item here that can be worked with. So that can then be saved. All right, so we have these objects, we have these functions, so how in the world do we know um, what to do, and, or how do we know which ones are available to people, and, and where do we find them? So there are a couple of different methods for doing it. One is MarkEdit provides help documentation, and that help documentation is going to point people to um, these methods. Um, and what I'll do is I'm going to go through the rest of the slides before I go back and show you this, because there's just a couple. Um, and it'll point you to the documentation. If you go to the MarkEdit website, um, there's a new part of the, the website called the Knowledge Base, and that has a link to these, um, these uh, application interfaces. Um, I mentioned the sample script. Here's the sample script for using Z39.50. Um, oh, I guess I do have two, uh, one other thing. So, uh, MarkEdit can also be automated via the command line for folks who are doing. Um, work with Linux. This is how a lot of people automate MarkEdit. Um, it's a program called CMarkEdit. Um, you can wrap the functionality around um, in a process. Uh, boy, that's hard to read. Um, the CMarkEdit program, if you run it from the command line um, and use dash H, you can see all of the functions that are available to you. It provides uh, functions for making, breaking, batch processing, character conversions, um, joining, splitting, and uh, there's also a part of the function that will allow you to mark validation. Um, so you can do all of those things within the command line tool, um, which then allows you to um, automate uh, mark edit, some of mark edits functions uh, through uh, Linux or something like that. So, um, Alright, so those are the slides. So let me go to uh, the back to the, the tool here so we can look at where you get help. All right. So if I want help, MarkEdit has it built into the program, so you can find it under Contents and Help. It opens up the help file. Um, there's a mark here called For Programmers, and it gives you two external links. One is to the .NET API. Um, there are a handful of folks who actually develop op applications that use MarkEdit as their engine for doing processing. And if they're .NET applications, they may work with the .NET API. Um, if you're doing scripting, you're going to work with the COM API. And so that's this uh, link right here. And then we'll open it um, inside uh, this browser so then you can work with it and so you can see it. Um, the other place where you will find this information is from the uh, MarkEdit website. See what I was looking at last time. So from the MarkEdit website, 
you can go to the knowledge base and watch this. Oh, you went to oh maybe I didn't make it public. Second. I will show it to you on this here. Should have made it public. So I'll make sure I did. Uh, so knowledge base. So you should see a link right here. It's the COM APIs. And then that will take you out to um, the document as well. Um, this is where you get to see um, how you interact with the API. So if you want to know what functions are available to you from the Mark Engine, we can go here, Mark Engine class, um, methods. And this gives you all of the methods that are available to you um, to interact with as a developer. So if I want to stream, so I don't have files, but I want to be able to stream, um, this is the streaming function. It's basically I mark back a string, I pass it a string of mark data. That's, that's pretty much it. Um, if I want to be able to delete fields or add fields or export in tab delimited format, um, to work with the XML functionality. All of these provide you with um, a uh, signature for how the function works and then uh, necessary a description of um, the parameters that are um, accepted. The same thing is true when working with uh, oh uh, when working with um, query class. So that's the Z39 class. You have parameters. So we have a batch search and we have a general search. Um, but this is also where you get the interface, the information about um, enumerations. So those numbers. So here's the Z39.50 search. Um, we have here uh, type. So type would be four for title, um, 116 for keyword. Or if you want to create an actual raw Z39.50 search, you pass it a negative number in the integer type and then the keyword parameter is actually a um, raw Z39.50 search. So um, if we went back to our example here, our Z39.50 example, what that means is changing this 4 to a negative 1, and then we could say uh, at attribute 1 equals and say four. I think that's syntax. Yeah. So it didn't find anything, but that was the syntax. So it, it actually passed it as a uh, a raw Z39.50 search. So you have the option to be able to pick different types. It's the general gist there. All right. So this is where you get your your material. So this is I try and update this um, as often as I update the API. Um, it is uh, some of the documentation um, for parameter information and return values is a little bit light. Uh, I've actually been going through um, lately and updating all of this, uh, especially since uh, there's a couple folks who have been asking for some API changes um, to. Uh, strengthen the, the documentation that will be here, so um, when that gets finished, that will get updated, um, and it will be uh, available and a little bit more easy, I think, for folks to work with. All right, so those are the slides, and that gives me um, 15 minutes. Hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that folks have some questions. I realize that this is a, a harder one to deal with um, in an hour. Uh, but hopefully this gives you some ideas of how you might be able to create scripts around the application um, and where you might be able to get some resources to be able to expand upon the kind of very generic um, script wizard uh, options to be able to do uh, maybe more complicated revisions. <coughs> Excuse me. So with that, um, I will uh, stop and see if there are any questions, and I can flip over so I can see if anybody's typing.
Let's see if there's any questions here. <clears throat> And I will say that um, these are the kind of, you can ask questions about scripting on the Mark Edit listserv. Um, you'll probably find fewer people there um, who can do it. Uh, let's see. Uh, please repeat your statement if you can use H in the C mark, you can. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so in the command line tool, um, you pop this open, I might as well just run it. So in the command line tool, you run it from the command prompt. See if I've set up my, see if I have to go to the right. Very good. So um, what I would recommend if you're going to use the command line tool is to create an environment. If you're in Windows, create an environmental property. If you're in Linux, create a, a, um, a uh, property for being able to just kind of or put it in your path statement so it's easy to get to. So yeah, you can run um, mark edit slash um, c mark edit dot exe uh, dash h oops it's help oh wait ah so, do, 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 do. Spaces in the uh, can't find path. I'm having problems here finding the path. Oh, it's not in the right place anymore. One second. I moved a bunch of stuff around, so it's in a different location. I need to update my environmental path. Okay, so here we go. So, yeah, if I was gonna, I should, I would have had my environmental path updated, but I would see mark edit dot exe dash h, and then that outputs the um, the functionality that's available to you uh, through the mark editor. So this will tell you um, all of the the parameters, and so each one of these dash parameters is what you would include um, if you're going to run the tool. So, for example, if I was going to break a file, I would have my function here, and then dash s, and then go to the file, c slash users, reset, slash desktop, slash, what's the name of one of my files? Uh, So the file name here, uh, destination, so where I want to put it. And then I would include the option that I'm using. So in this case, I'm breaking the file. So dash break, <clears throat> if I wanted to do character sets, I would include a character set. So I'm fairly certain those might be Mark 8 files. If I wanted to process them to UTF-8, I could do a, a dash UTF-8, and then that would initiate the UTF-8 option. And then I just run it, and it tells me there, when it's finished, there are 33 records that have been processed. And if I go back um, to my desktop, I'll, I'll find those records. It should be, I think, on the last, yeah. So they've been broken and, and put available there. So hopefully that answers your question. 